Welcome to the podcast, Let the Prophet Speak. Today we are going to study Daniel 3a. That is the first half of chapter 3 in the book of the prophet Daniel or Daniel. In the last chapter, we learned of the story of the revelation and interpretation of the contents of the dream of the king of Uchadnezar and its interpretation by Daniel, by Daniel to Nebuchadnezzar. Just to remind you, because it's important to understand this chapter, that Nebuchadnezzar had had a dream. He was very worried and anxious and nervous about this dream, but he couldn't even remember what the contents of the dream were. None of his magicians were able to identify what this dream was. He condemned them all to death. But Daniel came forward with an interpretation, actually first by revealing what the dream was. And the the dream was uh, D- Daniel addressed to the the um, the fears and the psychology behind what would make a person like Nebuchadnezzar nervous and upset. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar was all about power and wealth. He saw himself as the wealthiest and most powerful king that it was strong enough to conquer everyone and everything in the, his known area of the world in the Middle East. And Daniel identified that what he's afraid of is that his power and his wealth is fleeting. It's something that maybe some other person might come by someday and conquer his kingdom and some other might conquer his kingdom. And Daniel addressed those fears directly and told him, that this was the meaning of your dream. You saw yourself as this statue with this head of beautiful gold, which symbolizes how Nebuchadnezzar thinks of himself. But then somebody more powerful, maybe less sophisticated and less wealthy, but stronger at war might beat you and then someone else might conquer him. And then, but there's only one thing that's going to last forever. And that is the belief in the one true God that is forever. So you should humble yourself before him. What Nebuchadnezzar did at the end of chapter 2 is very important to remember as we enter chapter 3. He went and he bowed down to Daniel, to Daniel, not to Daniel's God. He did not turn and bow to God himself, in which case he probably would have put his back to Daniel. But rather, he said, he said he bowed to Daniel and he said, your God must be the most the, the one, the God of gods, the most powerful, the revealer of mysteries who enabled you to figure out this secret. And then he went ahead and he made Daniel um, uh, in charge and, and Daniel brought his friends, his three friends, and this is also very important to understanding the chapter we're about to read, his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, which was their Hebrew names, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Avednego, which was their Babylonian names. And Daniel made them administrators over the province, lifted them up from the position of being mere advisors and made them administrators. Administrators are usually in charge and enforced with the administration of monetary matters, including taxation. So while it is a big and important position, it's also a position that generates hatred and generates dislike among the people and they become the head of what people don't like about the government. And we'll see why that's important. And it's a position in which Jewish administrators throughout the centuries and ages have been put in this position, which generated hatred towards them. And we will see this also in the chapter we're about to read. Because immediately after, well, the timing isn't clear, because remember these stories were written down hundreds of years after they actually happened. So it's not clear, you know, what exactly the chronology of everything is. But just in the way we're reading it, it would seem that immediately after Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had this great revelation of, uh, and, 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 and said to Daniel that your God must be the greatest and most powerful of all gods, Nebuchadnezzar does the following, and which apparently indicates that he didn't really learn the lesson that Daniel was trying to teach him. This is verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar Malka avad tselem didahav. 
Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made a great big statue of gold. Presumably the statue was a statue of himself. Rume Amin Shitin. Its height was 60 amot tall. An ama, we now know from archaeological excavations and so on, we know that it's approximately a foot and a half. So 60 amot means it's 90 feet tall. That is quite high. Pisoye and its width was Amin Shit, was six amot, which would be nine feet. The um, measurements, uh, all the commentators, Taters pretty much mentioned that these measurements don't sound right. Something that tall would have to be much wider in order to be stable. It seems quite tall, but also quite thin. And there's various answers to that question, which I'm not going to deal with here. I just want to make sure I, I bring up that issue, uh, exactly how such a thing could be stable and stand. Akimei bebikat Dura, and he set this up in the valley of Dura, or the plain, I'm sorry, the plains of an area in Babylon, the Medinat Bavel, in the, in the province of Babylon. And then he went ahead, Nebuchadnezzar Malka, and the king Nebuchadnezzar, Shelach, he sent to his, uh, through out his kingdom, and there's a system of levels of officers, so he sends the message to his closest of officers who send it to their 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 underlings who send it out to their underlings and eventually get the message gets out to the public so we're going to have a list of different positions in Aramaic of uh, in the Babylonian government Shalach he sent Lemichnash to gather all of the Akashtar Penaya Signaya Upachavosa Adagozraya Gidovraya Ditovraya Tiftoye um, this, those are lists of different officials and titles. All of those um, who were um, in all of his provinces, and all of the various rulers and officials in the entire kingdom, that they should all come to a ceremony of, of inaugurating or dedicating this statue, that the king Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Beidayin, so therefore, at the, after this all happened, mitzkanshin achashtar penaya signaya upachavotza agadas adargozraya gidovraya ditovraya tifto ye bechol shul tonei medinasa lachanu katzama. So all of these officials, I'm not going to translate them because I'm not sure can translate them as governors, prefects, counselors, judges, officers, baba. Who knows what the right translations are? Various of all the officials of the entire kingdom came to this inauguration ceremony or dedication ceremony of the statue the Hekim Nebuchadnezzar Malka that the King Nebuchadnezzar had established. And they all stood in front of this giant statue that Nebuchadnezzar had placed. And the announcer called out in a loud voice, Lohon Amrin Amemaya Umaya Vulishonaya. You, all of the peoples of all of the nations, all of these nations that are all subservient and under the kingdom of Babylon, and many different languages, there was different languages, cultures, peoples, all of whom had been incorporated into the kingdom of Babylon. Kol Karna. When you sound, when you hear the sound of a horn, all right, blowing mashrokisa kasros sabcha pisanterin sumponya. These are all sounds. Those are all names of different instruments of announcements of noise. I can try to translate them all. There's various translations. The bottom line is they're horns, flutes, um, trumpets, uh, pipes, all sorts of instruments. All sorts of instruments. In other words, when the when the uh, all air almost like the air raid sirens go off, then immediately the entire nation across everywhere, everyone should bow towards this this great gold statue, the Hekim Nebuchadnezzar Malka that the King Nebuchadnezzar has has put up. is good, and if you don't fall down and bow, at the time. When, when the noise comes out, the punishment will be being thrown into a burning, fiery furnace. 
Kol Kaveldu. So there, so this was this announcement went out. One wonders here what happened here exactly. That that I thought Nebuchadnezzar just learned that God is the most powerful of all gods. Didn't he just bow to Daniel and say, "Oh, now I know who the real God is." But now he's making himself into a god again. Clearly, he wasn't yet convinced. It wasn't enough. And I think that if, if, if you remember how we studied chapter 2, there was no, in chapter 2, the only lesson that Nebuchadnezzar really learned was that Daniel is a really smart man. And that Daniel, maybe he used his god in order to figure out what to say. But he didn't have, but he didn't learn the lesson that Daniel's God, so to speak, is somehow more powerful than the other gods. He didn't learn the lesson of of devotion to the idea that that there is only one truth, that there is only one God, there is only one who created the heavens and the earth, and that and that devotion to this idea is central towards achieving and learning and understanding the truth. He saw what Daniel said, that yes, nation after nation after nation, one's more powerful than the other, and so on. But he didn't get the part of the God being the one that's forever, and that the only way to unify the world would be to teach the entire world the principles and ideas that God wants us all to learn, the ideas of justice, the ideas of righteousness, the ideas that we need to all work together to make the world a better place. And that the only kingdom that will ever last is the kingdom of God, which is the kingdom on the basis of which all of us, every human being on the planet, can unite and unify together. He didn't get that. He didn't get that part. Therefore, he was still thinking, right now, I'm the most powerful guy. He still worshipped power. He worshipped wealth. He worshipped himself. He did not get the full... So what's interesting is that in this chapter in Daniel, we are reading the book of Daniel, the book of Daniel, Daniel himself does not appear in this chapter. The king kind of gave him, must have given him some sort of a pass, or Daniel somehow avoided getting into trouble here and wasn't involved in what we're about to read about. What's important, but maybe the king thought, well, Daniel, he's a smart very smart guy, and he has access to, to this God of his that can, he can get himself, weasel his way out of anything. And that's the only lesson Nebuchadnezzar really learned. But he didn't learn the principle and the idea that Daniel really wanted to teach him, which was what I just explained, that the only nation that will truly last forever is the nation that gathers under God and works together, everyone, all nations, all languages, to, towards the common goal of building a world of peace, a world of justice, a world of righteousness, the world which was prophesied by all of the prophets that preceded Daniel. And so, uh, therefore, therefore, it makes sense what we're about to read what happens. So, the king made this decree, and let's see what happens. Kol Kovel Dina, this is verse 7, after all of this, um, this, uh, uh, stuff that went on, all of this um, uh, uh, pomp and circumstance, pomp and so on. Beizimna at every time, kedei shamin kol amamaya kol karna mashokisa katros abchop santerin. That whenever ever the entire nation heard the sounds of all of these horns and instruments, v'cholchnei zimara and all instruments, naflin kol amamaya, the entire nation would fall on their face. Umaya, Velishanaya, all of the different cultures and languages and people would all fall upon their face, Sogdin Litzelam Dava, and they would all bow to this golden Tzelam, this golden statue, the Hekim Nebuchadnezzar that the king put up. All of these nations had their own gods already, but now they see that Nebuchadnezzar is the powerful one, Nebuchadnezzar is the wealthy one, he can make this giant golden statue. So now they had no problem bowing to this god now, it's all good. He's powerful, he's strong, he's great, he's wealthy, he's the leader, and he's going to throw us into a firing furnace if, if we don't, so everyone bowed. Except, of course, the people that were believing Jews, because they understood 
that we should not bow to gold. It's not wealth and power and might that makes something a god. That's not what we are worshiping. That's not the goal of this world to become powerful and wealthy and strong and rule over others. But the goal of this world is to build a better world, a world of peace, a world of tzedek, a world of mishpat. These are the goals of the Jewish people. So therefore, no, they will not bow down to this gold statue. And of course, when the other people saw that the Yehuda A, that the Jews were not doing it anymore, were not fulfilling the, the um, command of the king, the first people they are going to um, bring the wrath against are the king's officials, the three Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, who were appointed as officials over them, and they viewed them as the guilty ones. So, verse 8, Kol Kaveldina, Bezimna. At this time, when, when all of this was going on, Kirivu Guvrin Kastoin, some of the Chaldeans, came to the king. Va'achalu kartsehon. The meaning of this is a little bit of a challenge, but achalu here is from the Hebrew word rachil. Rachil is is a is a um, literally a merchant, a peddler. But in the Torah, it is used. Uh, a peddler is 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 used to refer to a person who walks around and tells slander and stories about other people. Otelech rachil be'amecha is a verse in the Torah which means do not go around and tell stories about others and slander them. Kartsehon could, could mean a kritzat ayin, which is like a wink. You know, wink, wink, I'm telling you the real the story. You know, this is what they say. It's a cynical wink. It could also mean, achalu could also mean to consume, and kartsehon can mean meat. So, the, it, and, and it almost, almost a parallel language. M- many of the commentaries say that this means they were they came to slander the Jews because now they have the opportunity to do that. D Yehuda A to slander the Jews, right? This because it's just which which indicates that it wasn't only the three officials that didn't bow down, but it was in general the Jews in general, at least the believing ones, didn't bow down to this idol, and now they have the chance to slander them, and one learns from here that the slandering and wink wink with the eyes can do damage just as bad as literally devouring the person's flesh. Stories and slander can bring about the death of another person. And what did they do? Verse 9, Anovo Amrin Nebuchadnezzar Malka. They went and they said to Nebuchadnezzar the king, Malka l'almen chayi, may the king live forever. The usual flattery. Ant Malka, this is verse 10, sumpt to aim. You the king, you gave out in order, that any man that hears the sound of the trumpets and all of these, the lists of all of these instruments, that immediately upon hearing that sound, he needs to fall on his face and bow to this golden statue. And whoever does not fall and bow, he will fall and be thrown into a furnace. However, there are these Jewish men, or these Jewish people, and of them there are some that you appointed, al avidat medinat babel, regarding the business, appointed to run the business of the land of Babylon. This is very, just as the dream story was very reminiscent of the Joseph story, this story is very reminiscent of the story in the book of Esther, which one day we'll get to on this podcast as well. Um, you appointed this, 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 the, these people as, as administrators, and their names are Shadrach, Meshach, Avednego. Guvraya, these men, Ilech, Lo Samu, Aloch, Malka, Te'em. These men, they don't listen to your decrees. They don't bow to your God. And they refuse to bow to the, um, to the uh, um, great statue that you set up. So, of course, Nebuchadnezzar, who still 
hasn't learned what Daniel was trying to teach him, Nebuchadnezzar, who still thinks that that godliness is measured in power and wealth and gold and 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 might and so on, is now enraged because he sees that these Jews, these Jewish people, are now represented by their three leaders, Shadrach, Meshach, and Avednego, or Hanania, Mishael, and Azariah, which is their Hebrew names, refuse to give in to what he is trying to establish, that I am the greatest, I am the wealthiest, I am the strongest, and there are no other principles or ideas that are more important than, than subjugating yourselves to me. So, in a rage of anger and fury, Amar, he announced, Bring these three men to me immediately. So, of course, the, the, the officers went out and they brought them in front of the king immediately. So, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, Amar, and we see that Nebuchadnezzar, in many cases, and we saw this with Jeremiah as well when Nebuchadnezzar was in Judea, conquering Judea, that before he punished his, the people, we saw this with the king Tzedkiah, we saw this with Tzedkiah's men, we saw this with everyone. He would bring them in front of him directly and engage in conversation before he, he, um, he delivered his verdict. So, so and this is the same pattern with the same person. Those of you that study Jeremiah together with us would remember that from the end of the book of Jeremiah. This is verse 14. Nebuchadnezzar then announced and said to them as follows, Is it true? You three. And he named them by names. You are not bowing to my God. Now, what does this mean, my God? Almost always, in all of the words of the prophet, when, when someone addresses their God with a small g, the name of the God, the identity of the God is given. This statue isn't given a name. He's not being called Baal, for example, which is one of the, the, the Babylonian well-known gods. But it seems that this statue of gold, which is so high and strong and big, what Nebuchadnezzar is saying, Lelohai to my God, because what's my God? My God doesn't even have a name. My God is wealth. My God is power. My God is strength. My God is me because I believe since I am the most powerful and the most wealthy, I am therefore God. That's what he means. You refuse to go and worship my God. And to the statue of gold that I have put up, right? You refuse to bow. In other words, you think there's something else in this world? You think there's something else more powerful than wealth and power itself? Is that what you're thinking? I've given you a chance. If right now you are willing to go ahead soon, the next time when we blow the trumpets, when you hear the sounds of all of the all of the trumpets and, all, again, the whole list of instruments and noisemakers. If, if you go ahead and are willing to bow to this great statue that I have made, right, then that's fine. Then fine, you can, I'll let you off the hook for the fact that you didn't do it before. Especially now that all eyes are on you. Then fine. But if you refuse to do that, if at the time of the noise you refuse to bow down, I'm going to throw you into a furnace. And where is this God that can save you from my hands? In other words, he couldn't imagine when he was speaking to them that they would be willing to give up their lives 
So he's imagining that they're thinking that they have some other God that will be more powerful than him or some other king or some other something that's stronger and bigger than him that'll save them. And he's saying, I wonder who, who is that there is no such God in the world that can save you from me. I'm the most powerful. Remember, he's thinking that power and wealth is everything. And he knows that power and wealth, he has more than anything else and the ability to decree upon them and get to have them thrown into a fiery furnace. No one can save you. It hasn't even entered his mind that they are willing to not bow down on principle even if they know the punishment is going to be death. That they have something even loftier than power and wealth that they worship and they believe in. Anu Shadrach, so what was the answer? What did they say? And this is really a strong um, point here. Um, I'm sorry, verse 16. Anu Shadrach, Meshach, Va'aved Nego. So the three of them answered and they said to the king Nebuchadnezzar as follows We do not have any need to answer you regarding this matter. In other words, we have no... We, you just asked us the question, which was, which God is more powerful? We don't need to answer that question because we're not here to tell you that we have some kind of a power that's mightier than you. We know that in terms of humanity and in terms of what we see in front of us, that you are the most powerful and wealthy person in the world. That's not what we're not here to argue that. Yes, it is true that the God that we worship, he is able to save us from you. Our God is all-powerful. If He decides to save us, He can. But that's not the point. He can save us from this burning fire. And He can save us from your power too. But still, But even even um, however, we, um, e- even if he does not, right, e- uh, even if he does not desire to save us, even if he has no need, even if God decides that we should not be saved and we do not deserve to be saved, right, this God to whom we worship, Right? We will still not worship your God. And we will still not bow to the golden statue that you put up. So what they're saying here is, we have no, again, and let's just review this. This is really powerful words. We have no need to answer your question and engage in an argument with you over whose God is more or less powerful because that's not going to change our decision. Of course, our God is powerful enough to save us from you, should he decide and determine that that's something that he wants to do. But that's not the reason why we're not bowing. The reason why we're not bowing is not because our God is more powerful than you. The reason why we're not bowing is because what you're asking us to do is to admit that God equals power and God equals wealth and God equals what you, Nebuchadnezzar, represent. And we will never do that because that is not what God is. So we're going to stop here and learn soon the second half. Thank you so much for participating in 3A. Looking forward to finishing chapter 3 in the next podcast. Then we will start from verse 19.